Okay. Thanks everybody for coming and, and uh, people are going to be rolling in for just a little bit as we just get started up. But um, I appreciate everybody coming. Everybody I uh, hope is, is healthy and, and uh, taking care of yourselves. Uh, this is our um, one in a series of webinars that we've been doing. Uh, this is a, we're going to have you have a co-host today of, of Jeremy Lucas. Jeremy Lucas, this is going to be his first time co-hosting with us. He's going to do several more in the, in the month to come. So uh, this one here is going to be called Finding Your Apex with a Corner Radius Math Channel. He's going to talk about the, the function of corner radiuses and, how, and what are they and, and how to maybe give you a better explanation of exactly what they are and then several different ways of, of finding them and finding if you're doing uh, hitting those correctly and uh, and we're going to look at it in in the data as well so it'll be a it'll be a good time for that so the first thing though i'd like to do is uh is is give some quick introductions to some of the folks that are going to be uh helping us uh, we have a question and answer box that uh, will pop open you can pop that open if you wish uh we have a chat box everybody can chat back and forth in there but if you have questions pertaining to the to the topic today the corner radius math channel and finding apexes make sure you type them into the question and answer box uh, that way the folks can answer them quickly or they sit there and then uh, Jeremy and I will will try to work those in as we make it through the uh, the presentation and if we have something we haven't maybe covered we'll have a, a dedicated time at the end of the webinar to to chat about uh, some questions and answers that happen there so so the first thing that we'll do is uh, we're, we're going to start with some some introductions. I'm going to I'm going to throw up a poll though, and and everybody start to uh, start to take a look at it. And this is just again these polls are are helpful to us when we're trying to understand what uh, our next topics are, understand who the audience is, and then we continue to adjust what uh, what we're bringing. So I'm going to launch a poll here that's going to talk about the, uh, the the pieces of equipment that you have. You have. Uh, it's on your screen now should be you can you can choose what you're using it's multiple choice if you have a couple of different pieces make sure you, you grab those uh, while you're doing that when you get all done if you submit that you can uh, it'll clear the screen and you can see a little bit better so for uh, so for the for some quick introductions just around the room here as we uh, people are going to be answering those questions so first we'll uh, we'll talk with Robbie for just a second Robbie hello good morning uh, good afternoon good evening depending on what type of the world you're in um, my name is Robbie. I've been doing the webinar series since the beginning with the company for uh, roughly 10 years. Uh, I'll be doing a lot of the questions and, uh, and answering for, uh, for Roger and Jeremy today. So uh, if you got them, put them in that question and answer box. Thank you very much, Robbie. Robbie does such a great job back there with the rest of them, including uh, Cameron. Give us a little bit about you, Cameron. Hey, hey everybody. Thanks for coming today again. I'm uh, getting excited for uh, this next one with uh, Jeremy Lucas. So we are, uh, you know, same thing. Uh, we'll be here answering questions in the background. Uh, if you guys have anything, uh, preferably on topic, but any other off topic questions, we'd be happy to answer as well. Um, and uh, just let us know what you need. Thanks for coming. Perfect. The, uh, uh, they'll be answering them quickly. And then, and then at the end, we'll, we'll probably bring them in to help us answer a couple of the other questions as well. So they're not just going to be back there uh, typing along there. We'll, we'll bring them up and have them chat with us as well. So uh, I just uh, ended that polling before we jump to Corey. I'm going to uh, uh, close that down for you so it's out of your way if you haven't had a chance. Uh, Corey, tell us a little bit about you and where you, what you're doing. Hey, yeah, so I've been with AIM for about a year now. Uh, this is my second webinar. Definitely enjoyed the first one. Looking forward to this one uh, very much. Uh, glad everyone could make it and, you know, hopefully we can get some answers questions or get some questions answered. <laughs> or, or one way or the other, right? Thank yeah, you very yeah. much, Corey. Thank you for, uh, for your help. And we have also, we have Emiliano from um, all the way from Italy here helping us out with some of these different questions and, and typing in some answers and, and there for some feedback at any time. So Emiliano, give us a little bit about uh, you and yourself. Hello, uh, here is Italy, Milan, Italy, uh, AIM headquarters. I work for, for AIM since uh, 20 years and I, I'm with the software development teams. I developed uh, Ray Studio Analysis 2 and I'm uh, working on uh, Ray, Studio 2, Ray Studio Analysis 3. Perfect. Enjoy and thanks for having me here. You're, you, thank you very much for helping us out, Emiliano. It's very, very helpful. Okay. The, um, all right, let's jump up to the next slide. The next slide, we're, let's, let, let's introduce Jeremy. I'll, 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 uh, Jeremy will ch chat a little bit of, in more depth about himself, but Jeremy's been an AIM dealer for, for a while with us and uh, very, very active out at the racetrack helping, helping people and uh, somebody that I chat with. Jeremy's a, 
you know, an engineer that, is, uh, that uh, can help us out with some of these e e even more detailed questions sometimes, but he lo loves the driver coaching part. And of course, he, he races his own cars and has learned a lot about that. So uh, let's turn this over to, to Jeremy to give a little bit deeper uh, introduction. And then uh, when he gets to the, to the point of kind of finishing that up, I'm going to swap over to Ray Studio and Jeremy's going to talk about corner radiuses. So Jeremy, introduce yourself a little bit deeper and I'll get ready to give you the mouse and give you Ray Studio. Okay, thanks, Roger. Well, um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here uh, doing this with you guys today. Um, this is certainly the largest group of people I've ever talked to. Occasionally, we'll have some local seminars and stuff that we've done with local NASA groups and those kinds of things. But, um, you know, I, I started my journey in this 20 years ago when I started racing. And I, I, I through that process, I've got to a point where I needed more information to keep improving uh, with my own driving that's where i turned to data acquisition and being an engineer it just kind of came naturally and i started helping other folks with it so it's something i enjoyed doing and hopefully uh, we can share something with you guys today that helps uh, expand your knowledge on things as well okay so what we're going to do is we're going to jump right in right into to race studio 2 we're going to talk about uh, uh, these radiuses and how to spot them how to see them uh oops i'm sorry i think you're you wanted actually to continue yeah, on we, with we that, need to start with the, uh, so the uh yeah there you go uh so uh, i'm going to bring that one up and you can start chatting about it and i'll give you control of the mouse and when we get to uh ready to go back into into uh, race studio i'll jump in there again there okay. you go jeremy thank you very much all right so uh one of the main Things that we're going to talk about today is corner radius and when you look at what corner radius is by the math channel definition it's simply um, the velocity squared divided by the lateral g and one thing that's important to keep in mind whenever you're talking about math formulas and there's a whole separate aim webinar just about how to input math formulas so we're not going to cover that today but um, whenever you are combining variables you need to make sure that they are in the same units. So for example, in this case, GPS speed is in miles per hour that we're gonna use. So we have to convert it to feet per second. And the, the lateral G is a unitless G. So we have to add on the feet per second for gravity. So that's those constants that come into play in the formula here. Whenever I'm doing a presentation like this, I always like to color code the values in the formula so that you can quickly understand what is a uh, calculated number, what is a measured number, or what is a constant. And the constants can be entered as their actual number, or when you get a little more deeper into math channels, you'll see there's actually an uh, internal table in the software where you can add your own constants. So here we just have velocity squared converted to the proper units divided by the GPS lateral converted to the proper units. Now, one thing I'm, you see on here as well is I've got this ABS, that stands for absolute value. And I use that simply because um, it makes it a little bit more compact to display on the screen. Because normally this could be a positive or a negative number. And by doing absolute, it's going to show always as a positive. That way when I'm viewing it on the screen, I, I can not take up as much of the screen and have more available to display other things. It's just kind of a personal preference. One other thing to keep in mind about corner radius is there are some other variations out there that you may see if you are sharing data with somebody else or looking over somebody's shoulder or see another presentation talking about corner radius. You may also see it referred to as inverse corner radius or curvature. And that's simply um, one over radius. So it comes out as a unitless number. The big difference there is that when you look at it on the scale, and we'll show some examples, the values will go from zero and increase to the minimum point. Whereas on corner radius, when you're going straight, the value is infinity and then comes down to the minimum point. So it's just kind of a different uh, presentation method. But we'll show some examples of that so you understand what the difference is. So let's talk about what corner radius is when you graph it on an on a, um, XY plot or your measures graph and aim. So for example, here we have radius and distance, just like you would have if you're looking in your software. However, I've simplified the curve a little bit to help um, make sure that you understand the concept of what we're looking at. So here's the keyhole at Mid-Ohio, which happens to be my home track. And you can see two different lines drawn on the track. This green arrow shows the tightest turning point for that line that was taken. Where that would show up is here on the graph. So again, this is the minimum tightest point that you're turning on track. 
So whenever you see a corner event from the beginning to the end of it, if the peak point, the bottom point, is shifted to the left, that is indicative of a late apex turn. So it's kind of the opposite. So if, if the, the dip is early, it means it's a late apex. And then the converse is true on an early apex. If it's an early apex, then the dip is to the right because you're tightening up the corner as you get to the end. So hopefully that's clear for everybody. There's a couple other types of scenarios that I wanna mention also. And the easiest one, of course, is the mid corner apex where you know your minimum turning value is roughly symmetrical in the middle of the corner. This may be a little flatter for a longer period depending on how long of a corner you're talking about. But that minimum point would coincide roughly with the ge geometrical middle point of the corner. The one that is a little bit more complicated is double apex. And on a double apex, you may see like a W shape or two peaks. Um, and you would have maybe two points on track where you're, you're tightening the wheel. These are tricky simply because sometimes um, they can be a little bit difficult to discern from the driver just making a late turn correction. So um, we'll look at a couple of those examples and try and you know, sleuth those out a little bit so you can have a better feel for when you're actually looking at a true double apex versus something where it's just a driver correction. And that formula that we mentioned at the beginning there, that is not an aim by default. So if you guys um, want a copy of this uh, document afterwards, it's going to be available from the links on the um, name site, or you can email me or Roger and we can send you uh, copies of these documents. All right, so what does these idealized curves look like when you're actually looking at some aim data? Here is some actual aim data for a late apex turn. Here's corner radius, which we're mainly going to be looking at, but I also wanted to show you curvature just so you can get an idea of the difference between the two. You can see we're going from infinity down to whatever the minimum corner radius is and then back up. And this is the reverse. There's a little bit of a difference in the uh, vertical scaling, so they look just slightly different, but you can see it's the same information just displayed a different way. Here's the double apex one in corner radius. You can see you have a peak here and a peak here. The peak is a little bit more visible in the curvature graph, but that's simply because of the scaling of this axis. The information is the same. I'm sure your next question is going to be though, when do I do these? When do I, what should I be doing? So I'm going to give just a very uh, generalized description of what that is. So this assumes a lot of things. We're talking about assuming a flat track, no elevation or camber changes. This is just assuming a flat track. And I'm gonna throw another radius term at you, and that is track radius. That is the radius of the actual inside of the pavement, not what you're driving, which we're talking about when we're talking about corner radius, but track radius is just the actual physical pavement. So if you have a constant track radius, typically you're gonna be doing a mid corner apex. Again, we're, we have the assumptions of being a flat track. If you are looking at a decreasing track radius, that is typically going to be a late apex. Increasing track radius would be your early apex case. However, kind of overruling all of these, when you have a long corner like we have here at the keyhole at Mid-Ohio, corners that are greater than 120 degrees, typically that's always going to be a late apex or a double apex turn. So hopefully that makes sense for you guys and can kind of be like a, you know, a rule of thumb that you have in the background that you then can look at when you're looking at attacking a track for the first time or um, looking at data that you're not familiar with and you don't know what the track layout is so specifically. Perfect, perfect. Jer now Jeremy, there's a, there's a question there, Jeremy, maybe while I'm yeah. bringing up, uh, I'm gonna bring up a poll and then switch over to analysis. Uh, Javier has a question there. Maybe you can take a look at that okay. and, and answer that real quickly. Um, I'm going to bring up lean angle here. is a little bit different, um, I think, than uh, corner radius because you still have will have a corner radius with motorcycles. However, um, if your sensor pod is tipping when you lean, you're not going to maybe able to use corner radius in the same uh, manner that we show here unless you have some way of correcting that so you get a, a corrected G lateral. Um, but lean angle is certainly very important for motorcycles because of 
the usage of the tire. And I think um, I wouldn't say you want one or the other. Both of those would be good if you're uh, doing uh, motorcycles. Yeah, the lean angle is a piece of calculating that uh, that lateral Gs. If you use the GPS base channels to do your corner radius, then the, to me, it's uh, it's not going to be a big difference between motorcycles and cars. You could actually fit probably both of those in together. Yeah, that's the other thing too that's really important to mention is that you know to do this math formula, um, it's simply GPS numbers. Right. Um, you can be doing this just with a simple solo. In fact, the data that we're looking at here right now is just solo data. And um, you don't need a lot of extra sensors to do this. Obviously, if you have more sensors, you get more information and more types of channels, and that's great. But you can do this even with the most basic of devices. Perfect. And, and speaking of uh, solos and experience levels and all that, let's, let, yeah. let's launch another poll that, uh, that will it's just trying to get a, a bit of information of who's who's watching and what we're doing here if uh, uh how much what what is your basic experience level not uh you know not adding up the hours that you're at the track but how how long have you been using aim aim software hardware and uh and and doing some of the stuff that we're talking about here today that will help us uh understand when we when we're building these webinar topics as well so the um uh, I see another question in there. Is there a formula for GPS ba based radius? I think it was on your first slide, but but uh, for those of you that uh, want this afterwards, at the, our, one of our last slides is going to give you some contact information, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to share share the GPS. Uh, based yeah, if you missed it on the first radius. slide, that's no problem at all. So that'll be that'll be coming in uh, uh, at the end. May sh just send Jeremy or I. Let's uh, let's end that polling. We've it's been going a, about a minute. If you haven't done that, you got just a few more seconds to to click on that, and um, it's a one time. Uh, it's not multiple answers on this particular case. So, um, and then I'll, let, let's end the polling, and then let let me share that and and give everybody an idea of who is uh, who is out here taking a look at stuff. The uh, again the. the the biggest, the biggest one is one year to two years, being about 19 to 20 percent, and then uh, brand new users are, are right there, fairly close at uh, at 15. So um, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate everybody taking a little bit of time to do that. You really are helping us get uh, get this stuff, these 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 webinars focused as much as we can on the bulk. We're always going to do some. We've got some scheduled that are coming that are going to be substantially more advanced, and some that are maybe beginning. And uh, but we always try to sneak something in uh, to all of them. You know, data points in there that even if it's a, a fairly early usage type webinar, we're going to try to throw some things out there with some formulas or just different ways of using the software that'll. To sure. help the guys that are doing the, the the bigger stuff. So I'm going to stop sharing those results so it gets it out of everybody's way. And then I'm going to turn this over to Jeremy and he can uh, and he can start the process of showing you some of the stuff right in Ray Studio. Okay, just as we're getting started here, just to um, remind people about, um, I saw some questions about the um, specific types of turns. If, you're, if your turn is going to be a long turn greater than 120 degrees, where like a 90 degree turn is, you know, just um, a, a simple turn, Turns that are longer than 90 degrees, like the International Horseshoe, those are almost always going to be that late apex type or double apex type. All right, so what we're looking at here is a lap of Mid Ohio with just some simple uh, solo one data. Um, we're going to go through this uh, turn by turn. You can see the speed trace up here at the top, and here is our corner radius graph. When I'm viewing corner radius, I tend to clip the view. Um, at a value of which, because it would just go up to infinity if I, if I scale it. So as long as I can see all of the turns in the corner radius view, I, I've, I've, it's as much scaling as I need to see. Let me show you quickly before we get started on the corner by corner here, what some of the, um, wrong button, what some of the other comparisons are. So for example, I mentioned curvature. So here is Here is corner radius and here is curvature. You can see curvature going negative and positive depending on which direction. That's because I did not apply absolute value in this particular representation of the data where I do have the absolute value applied to the corner radius. I could do absolute value for curvature and you would look like this where all the numbers are positive. So that's kind of the difference between them and you can see how the, the curve shapes are very similar between all of them. So it's kind of just mainly what you prefer uh, for presentation type. Um, I like to have them as the absolute, like I mentioned, so that I can maximize my view of the screen. And then the other thing I'm going to do here during this initial walkthrough is I'm going to turn on, um, turn off the per lap color so that you can see 
the scaling of this. Now, as we turn on the map, it's on GPS long, right? So I want to change that and come in here and show corner radius as my value so that you can relate what we see in the graph to what we see on the GPS map. All right, and then let, maybe I'll make this a little bit brighter just so the guys that on have dark monitors can see it a little bit better. There you go. And let's go, let's go through it uh, turn by turn. So I'm gonna just zoom in here a little bit so you can see it a little bit bigger. And let's look at turn one at Mid Ohio. So if I put my cursor roughly here in the middle of the turn, you can see that the minimum corner radius, this point down here, is definitely biased towards the left, which tells us what? All right, it tells us we have a late apex turn. Now, if, if I go in and I look at the, um, the color banding here for the, you can see, I'm gonna turn the scale here just a little bit since it's a little bit bigger of our turn. You can see here that the tightest point of the turn matches the same representation we're seeing here. The reason why I'm showing you this is so that those that are maybe better visual learners from a track map standpoint can help to build the relationship of what that means on the track map versus what it means in the data. You know, I, sometimes as an engineer, I, I'm just too comfortable looking at graphs and I forget to um, help people realize that, that connection there. But I think that's helpful for people to realize that you can see the same thing that we're seeing here in the graph over here if you want to do it with the color bands in the GPS map. Just remember, you have to have the per lap color turned off because if I turn that on, it's going to color it the color of the data. All right, let's move on to the next corner. And there is, you know, what kind of turn you want to take on these does depend too a lot on the type of car you have. Um, and again, when we're talking assumptions, maybe along with that flat assumption, I should have said that we're also assuming a non aero car because Obviously, when you bring air out in play, um, that changes a lot of things, just like it would if there was elevation on the track. All right, now we're up here at the Keyhole at Mid-Ohio. Here's roughly the middle of the corner. Again, we can see the data. The minimum corner radius is biased to the left. So again, this is another late apex corner, and we can see that here also with the color banding. Let's go down to the end of the back straight. And uh, if you're wondering what I'm doing here when I'm jumping around, on the data, I'm just simply zooming in and out, going back down to where I want to see a little bit bigger, see a little bit more detail. I can drag the bar down here at the bottom to display it a little bit more easier. Um, and just so you can see uh, better from your view, looking at it over the laptop. All right, so now we're going to go here to the roughly the middle of the corner. We see primarily a late apex type signature curve. There is a little bit of a correction here at the end, and, and I'm going to call this one a correction as opposed to a, um, a double apex, partially because of how late in the turn it is. Um, and knowing the track situation here, you know, frequently if you carry a bunch of speed through there, you find yourself pretty quickly going to be running out of track. So this is not an uncommon thing to see here at this particular turn at Mid Ohio with, with a driver correction. When I say a non aero car, I'm talking something that doesn't have, um, you know, a, a big spoiler on the back that's been added on for extra downforce or, um, you know, a front splitter, something that where you don't necessarily drive differently because of the, the tuning of the aerodynamic elements. It's something you have that has a lot of aero on it, you're going to have a lot of grip that is um, related to the speed of the car. So you can do things that you would not normally be able to do at speed. Because again, remember your tire only has so much friction available and you can be doing that to propel the car forward, to turn it, but you can't do all those things um, at the same time at the same rate. So we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the, um, the lining up of uh, speed and, and uh, your minimum corner radius. Let's finish going through these corners here. So we talked about that one here and then coming into the uphill here again middle of the middle of the corner roughly from a visual representation everything's biased to the left another late apex down here at this corner this is actually a downhill uh section while you're slowing down then kind of flattens out here for the turn you can see a little bit more of a w shape um 
I don't know exactly what the driver was doing here, but I can tell you at this particular corner, um, you always want to be in tight on the curb, if not running over the curb, typically, unless you have a very, very stiffly sprung car. So my guess is the driver here was just making sure that he, he, he got in tight. And then once he was in tight, he realized he could adjust a little bit. Um, if you run wide, you're, you really lose a lot of grip on the outside of the track here. So you really want to make sure that you're in tight in this particular location. All right, going down to the next corner, here we have kind of a fast left before the Honda Bridge. Now, if you look at the track map for this, it actually looks like it is a, um, a little bit of a decreasing radius corner. So you would expect this to maybe be a late apex. However, um, kind of in, along with what James talked about in the last session, if you look at the GPS slope, you can see that the track builds elevation as you get into the corner. So because of that, you actually have more grip later in the corner than you do earlier in the corner. So that allows us to be uh, doing our turning later into the corner without the sacrifice of speed because the, the simple weight of the car coming down and the, the ground coming up gives us a higher contact force on the tire and allows us to make more of that turning event when the geometric elevation of the track makes it more advantageous for us. So this is one of those ones where it doesn't follow the rule of thumb because of that type of elevation change. All right, let's go on a little bit further here. Now we have a, uh, a fast right-hander. And you can see here that this is a classic mid-corner apex. You just, you just, it's a very fast bend, even, even radius on the track, and you're gonna have a mid-corner apex for your data trace as well. Then we have the turn into Thunder Valley. So this is a low point on the track and then this is all uphill. This is another one of those cases where it doesn't follow the rule of thumb because of the elevation. So because you're building um, elevation through here, you do see a difference of it being, uh, instead of being an early apex, it shows up as a late apex in the data because while you're your slowest point, you're getting the turning done instead of trying to get it on the downside of the hill over here. Um, and then you often will see a correction like this here on this one because it's blind. So once the driver's eyes get up to the point they can see over the hill, um, they may decide they need a correction or there may actually be, um, if you're carrying absolute speed as possible, the entire time you're going up the hill, you have a slight slowing effect because you're going uphill and you may have to slow down to a certain point before you can make a correction. But you can see making a correction at this point did cause the speed trace to level off. So you really don't want to do that. Um, it happens, but that's not the ideal situation because you are gonna scrub a little speed if you have to make a corner correction like that late in the turn. This, like I said, this is uh, solo one data. So we're not gonna have any steering angle uh, channel to look at for this data. Um, I have looked at that before with this, and um, it's not, you don't see the same type of information with a steering angle channel as you see with this corner radius because this is a function of speed. So there is, there is more things going on in this math formula than there is with just looking at just a, a steering angle channel. All right, then we come up to this fast left here. And you can see that it's an early apex, or sorry, a uh, early minimum corner radius, which is a, a late apex type turn. And on the entry here, you also have one of those geometrical, uh, you know, altitude type things where the track is coming up as you're, as you're beginning the turn here. So you have more mechanical grip to initiate that turn and probably have to slow a lot less than you think here as well. It's the second fastest uh, corner at Mid Ohio after turn one, but yeah, you want to get your most of your turning done here in the early part of the corner, and you can see that uh, borne out here with the data graph as well. All right, and this just to finish up the lap here, we'll look at the uh, the the, uh, the carousel, and carousel is one of those long turns, right? So. 
you can see this early point almost levels off and is a an even constant radius, if you will. So the first this is a, this is a double apex turn here as this driver is driving it. This first part of the turn is done just like a constant radius. So you have a, you're keeping a very constant radius. It's just held for a longer period of time because you're mirroring what the track is doing. There are different lines to this corner. Some people will go out and late apex the early part. And then it's all about setting up here for your exit onto this little short shoot in the front straight because usually you don't have to lift off very much in uh, anything but a very high horsepower car here going on the straight. So what this turn is all about is setting up here for this next turn because that is just a, a classic mid corner um, constant radius turn. So this exit here becomes really important for making sure that you carry all that speed onto the straightaway. Okay, so that's a general walkthrough an entire lap showing you the characteristics of all the curves. Hopefully you guys understand now what the different shapes can look like and how that relates to what you see in the data. Um, so we got a couple of questions here. Just make sure we're not missing something before we go on to something else for data wise. Um, I saw someone who was asking about using the GPS uh, lateral G versus the built-in lateral G. Um, honestly, there's, there's no issue using either one. Um, one might have a little bit more noise in it. You get a little bit of a natural filtering effect from the GPS lateral, but it's really just a function of, um, in this case, we're using it because we're using solo data that doesn't have the option to have anything else. So we're just trying to build from what more people have, and certainly you can make it uh, more specialized as we go on. Okay, Roger, before we go on to the next topic here, anything else you wanna add? There's a couple of questions that are in the um, uh, in in the in the question and answer box that are a little more detailed. We want to get so some of those the the folks might answer in there and just say, hey, we'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll answer that. Uh, give us a holler or give us a call, email, and we can talk about some of those more detailed things. We're a, lot, a number of questions on accelerometers versus GPS based lateral G's and and uh, and the math that's being used there. Uh, Whenever we have anything that uh, you know has there, there's camber in the corners or there's there's lean on the bike, you know, and, and things like that, the GPS becomes one of those where we kind of take out some of those or can't model it. I guess maybe even a better way of saying it that uh, that we're what, what we're really seeing here is the end result of what that GPS sensor is is showing us. And if you turn around that sharp of a corner at that speed, you know, we'll be able to pick it up and see it. So. Um, one uh, maybe it's something that uh, a good poll that we can take a look at right now because we do have some folks that have been um, talking about different pieces of uh, uh, different types of race cars. Let's let's launch a poll that talks about uh, what form of motorsports do you do, and uh, you can uh, multiple choice. So if you if you if you race uh, you know um, motorcycles and carts or something, maybe you can uh, maybe you guys can answer that. We'll leave that up for for about a minute as Jeremy uh, starts. You know, thinking about showing you a couple more, even more detailed ways of understanding. Boy, are you hitting the radius point correct? You know, with 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 the forces that are available and the speed that you have, we'll uh, we'll start to look into that next, and and maybe even bring up a couple of different tests and 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 start to look at the differences. So, we're about um, <clears throat> just a few more minutes, a few more seconds on that poll. If you haven't answered it yet, we're we're probably right in there where we normally get uh, the number of answers. So, uh, with that, let's. Uh, I'm going to end that poll here in just a second and then I'll, I'll share it with everybody and everybody can take a look at it. So I'm going to end it now and then let me uh, let me share the results. Give everybody an idea of who's who's here worldwide taking a look at this. Uh, auto racing, you know, basically road racing kind of a kind of a thing is what most people are, are looking at that. Cart racing and motorcycles, yeah, cart racing a little bit extra but uh, and then motorcycle racing right there with it. So a few, a few more oval racers as well. So, uh, love all that. Thanks, uh, thanks for doing that. I'm going to stop sharing that, uh, and then uh, so I can get that off your screen, and then um, get this ready. And then um, Jeremy's going to continue on and, and talk, a, you know, show you a couple more neat ways of looking at the data, and uh, and getting ready for the um, uh, just a little bit more information of are you hitting it right? Go ahead, Jeremy. Sure. So the next thing I want to talk about here is. Um, minimum speed and minimum corner radius. So generally speaking, uh, when you think about the physics of the tire, like we mentioned earlier, um, we are going to understand that you, you can't be turning as sharp as possible and going as fast as possible. So <laughs> what we will see is there's, there should be an alignment between minimum corner radius 
and minimum speed. So what I'm doing here is I'm just gonna turn on the max min indicators to make it really easy for you guys to see where the max and min speeds are. I'm gonna zoom in here to turn one so we can see the triangles just for that turn. And you can see if I put the cursor at one of the minimums, um, these are not, uh, in this case, aligned. However, there's not a lot of uh, GPS speed difference between here and here. So even though it's not perfectly aligned, it's, it's very close to being the minimum speed for the car. Now, that's, a, that's kind of a consistency thing. And you'll notice as you look at data from different drivers, um, you will see whether they're being consistent. Here up at the keyhole, very good alignment between the minimum speed and the minimum corner radius. Let's turn on a couple extra laps here and see if um, if the driver is being consistent for you know um, other other scenarios. So that one's not that one's pretty close right there. Again, pretty close. And then this one, I think here, yeah, this one here, we've got a little bit more variance between the two. So in general, this is a somewhat consistent driver. And you will notice that as you look at these curves, that they tend to bunch together. So the driver is able to drive the same line consistently. Now, you only have this one set of data that we're looking at. So it may be not clear to you, hey, is this consistent data or not? So let's take a look at another set of data where we can see um, what someone else might be doing. All right, here we're going to look at um, a different driver. We're going to go back to the same keyhole. Let me change, let me go to per lap color here because we're going to show multiple laps. And I'm going to change the color here just so it's a little bit more visible for you guys. And we're going to zoom in again to the keyhole here. And I'm going to, I'm going to turn on a, um, a couple other laps just to see. Now you can see here with this driver, a lot more variation, right? Um, it's not surprising if you look at the lap times, you can see this guy's lap times aren't as good as the other guys. Um, these, are, these are the same type of cars, by the way, just so that the, the data is as comparable as possible. But you can see a lot more variation from the driver we were looking at initially, which is being very consistent to a lot of inconsistencies. And why this, this minimum corner radius consistency is important is because if you're getting your minimum corner radius point at the same time, you are also gonna be ending up at the same apex point. And I'm, I'm not one of those people that say, you've gotta hit this exact one square foot of pavement for apex every time. I think of it more of as a, of an apex zone, right? Because as you push the limits of the car, um, you will get a little bit more movement and action in the car that does change lap to lap and that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm not gonna tell you, you gotta hit the exact square foot every time, but you will see a big difference in the consistency between driving like this versus driving like this. And then also when you are now trying to understand if you can improve as a driver or take a different line and make an improvement for your overall case, if your consistency is like this, it's gonna be very difficult for you to tell if you're ready to go and do that type of experimentation. You need to be able to drive something consistently to effectively become a tester. So this guy here is maybe ready to try something different. He's maybe not doing a double apex, he's just doing a late apex. So maybe now he could go in and try something where he's doing a double apex to see if it's a better line for him and his car. Um, and you have to have some consistency in order to do that. And that's the kind of thing that's perfect on a, on a practice session or on a test day. And I would encourage somebody who is, can see that they're being consistent enough to then go ahead and go outside their comfort box, that they look for some consistency before they begin experimenting too much. Because if you go and try something new and you only do it for a lap or two, you're probably not gonna be doing it to its optimum. So for example, in this case, if this guy wanted to go try the double apex line that I personally prefer here and try and teach people, I would encourage them to try that double apex line for the majority of a session and then only go back and do his normal one for a couple laps. That way the comparison is as, as fair and as, as representative as possible. You can't just go try and do a new um, line through a corner, take a different apex 
one or two times and, and decide, oh yeah, that's, that's better or that's worse because you haven't really perfected it. So just keep that in mind when you start to look at the data and try and bring in you know, time compare as well to understand what was faster or slower. Um, you need to understand if you're being consistent enough to make that judgment. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the time compare here since we mentioned that and turn this back off so that we get a little, little bit of the screen clutter. So now you can see all these different lines, faster, slower, all over the place, right? It's gonna be really hard to look at this and say, oh yeah, this should be the one that you take because there's so much inconsistency. If I was working with this driver, the first thing I would be working on is trying to get it consistent so that then we could make changes. When you're kind of all over the map like this, which you can see by the variation, not really a point yet at which you can go and um, make large scale changes with the way they drive, right? Let's try and focus in on what you know is to be an improvement uh, from the line standpoint and try to nail that before you um, expand upon that. So if this was testing, right, and we were trying to understand, hey, is this line better than that? You're gonna use the time delta here to understand if your baseline lap, if you are faster or slower. So above the line is slower and below the line is faster. So in this case, the green trace comes into the corner faster, which gives us this delta here, but coming out of it, it loses it again. So I wouldn't say the way that the green trace did the corner is better because he lost it on the exit. So if you're able to combine some of the entry speed with maybe the, the fast lap, um, this light color baseline, that's kind of the ideal situation you'd want to do um, for this type of corner. If this was test data, we, you know, with some level of consistency to judge from. Okay, um, I see some questions. So let's try and relate those to some of what we're walking on here now. Um, the, the time compare is currently only able to be done based on the fastest lap. So whatever the fastest lap is loaded, even if we have two test sessions open, if I had the other one still open, that guy's lap was faster, it's gonna show up as the baseline for all these comparisons. Alan, your question of being able to zero in on that time compare only in that to zero right. it out is, is, not, uh, is not, we're not capable or able to do that. So right. you're, you're looking at cumulative time and then we're seeing the differences once you're zoomed in. So, so we, can't, uh, we can't zero that out. The, um, the, um, there was another question in there that talked about scaling for the, for the math channel of the radius math channel. In this particular case, he said, uh, I think it was something like 1200, 1200. He didn't have absolute value where, like oh, we sure, do yeah. here, but he, uh, his 1200, 1200 made it where he was getting a fairly flat line. A couple things you can do is when you first build your radius math channel, leave the, leave the mouse alone for a second there. Okay. Oops, geez. Yeah. And I when you, show. if you, yeah. um, there's a couple of things you can do. The, uh, the easiest one is go ahead and just leave the math channel like it is, and then come over here in the, in the scale bar and double click right here on the, on the left edge of the math channel you just built. And what that'll do is give you kind of a, a quick way of looking at what the, what the best scaling might be. It might jump to the infinity number. And if that is true, what, uh, Jeremy has done here is he scaled his from zero to 500, which is a pretty good way of doing that, right? And, and the way you can come in and double check that is just right click on the, on the channel radius name and, it, and the measures uh, information box will come up and select the channel you are. If you right click here, it'll already be selected and you can just scale it right here. Once you get that where you kind of like it in your graph and it's working for you, the, the trouble is, is if you close it and reopen the test, it's going to go back to what you had that minus 1200, 1200 that you talked about earlier. So then the next step would be is once you get and you know what you want, come back into your math channel functions and then, and then change the number right here under the math channel itself, zero to 500, which is what Jeremy has. Then every time you ever open up that math channel, uh, you know, with that test again, it'll, future, it'll scale yes. directly to the 500, you know, zero to 500 in this case. So that's the, uh, that's kind of the answer for that one there. Jeremy, you read uh, any one other one that catches your eye that yeah, we want to so, handle now? Um, there is also, somebody was asking about uh, lateral G and max lateral G. And if you, again, if you can make some assumptions of flat track, you will see a difference in uh, max lateral G based on the radius you're turning. Um, so, if you have a certain speed range, you can get a feel for your car saying, hey, if I'm in a 70 mile per hour turn, I can hit 1.2 Gs on a flat track. And you can start to understand the kind of the performance envelope of your car 
um, and what is sustainable for your car. Um, someone was asking again for me to re-explain what I was saying about this uh, carrying the speed entry. So because here on the, we have a whole different webinar talking about time delta. So I first of all suggest you watch that specific webinar, but because the, the lines diverge here, the green trace here is going faster up until this point. So if we can combine what the green is doing here with what the light blue is doing over here, that's a better combination. It may not be physically possible because you've just carried too much speed in to do that, but that you know you can pick and choose a little bit of what's going on to try and give yourself a goal to try and, oh, let's see if I can carry a little bit more entry speed and that kind of thing. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. All right, um, I think one other thing that we wanted to mention here was, um, especially when somebody's new and learning, um, you know, you can see a certain amount from the, the GPS track map, but another thing that is sometimes helpful for people is to see it with a, uh, a Google Earth overlay. And, you know, we'll be able to have more functionality for that in the next version of the software. But for now, if you just go up to File, Data, Export, you can export a KML file for any of the labs you want to and take a look at that in Google Earth to then be able to see track features that go along with those lines you were driving, whether it's the curbing that's at that point or whether it's a dark spot on the pavement or a signpost or whatever it may be. Roger, can you go ahead and show that uh, Google Earth image? All right, here's a bunch of different laps uh, going through the keyhole. And there are some functionality in Google Earth we're not going to get into right now where you can zoom around and move around and change the colors of the lines. But you can see a wide variety of lines being taken through here. And there is some surprising detail. Um, I mean, when I'm driving on track, I do use these dark spots on the pavement, like for especially this one right here, as one of my reference points to know if I'm, I'm getting my ideal line. And then, of course, click, you know, click on the screen the once, Jeremy. Click, click on the screen once so they can see where you're pointing. There you go. Sorry. That's I was okay. talking about this dark spot up here yeah. in the pavement. That's actually um, visible when you're on track. There's actually like three lines of pavement. There's an inner line, a middle line, and then an outer line. And those kind of seams between the pavement also kind of divide it up. And you can use that as a, um, a conversation point when you're talking about this with other people and how they take their lines. You can use those track markers, which are visible from this view um, to help that kind of conversation, especially when somebody's newer and, and needs more help. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, a very, very powerful tool. And as Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned, we showed uh, uh, Ray Studio 3 analysis, a, a brief, quick preview a couple of webinars ago. And um, we get, you get an, uh, an idea of this will be native in, in that piece of software. Right now we have to export it out. So it's, uh, but it's super, super powerful where you can see. So perfect. The um, we're, uh, we have a, we have a number of questions left. Uh, we'll, sure. we'll we'll take a look at those, Jer Jeremy. If you want to take a look at it real quickly, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna jump out and start uh, one more poll here as we're as we're uh, while you take a look at that. Maybe we'll answer if we can't get sure. to them. Make sure everybody understands that that uh, these questions and answers will be answered in a, in a document, and then the, this entire webinar will be placed up on YouTube, and there will be links to all of the uh, the relevant questions and answers that we that we did uh, uh, with a written approach, the answered ones that are in the answer tab right now on the question and answer. So you'll be able to read these and if we don't get to them, we'll certainly answer them and then place them up at the, in the YouTube links. So you'll see that a little bit later. Okay. Anything, you, you, anything you see there? Yeah, so when you're looking at, um, people are asking about if, if, you're, if you're, how do you know if you're getting the best possible through the corner? So when we talked earlier about um, understanding the type of lateral G that your car can build, based on the speed range of a corner and the, the terrain of the corner. Um, that's one way to understand, like, hey, wait a minute, when I take this corner this way, I'm getting this max lateral G. When I, when I take it over here, I'm not feeling as comfortable in only getting this lateral G. You may know that there's some more grip to be had and some more speed can be carried. Certainly, if you have a really good you know, uh, feel for the car, and as you try to carry more speed and you're running off a track, obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're simply running out of room. But that's a case where maybe trying to adjust your line may allow you to carry speed at different areas. And really, I mean, that's why, you know, driving on track never really gets old. I've been to, you know, mid-Ohio more times than I can remember. I still don't get it perfect every time. I still learn new things. The car changes, the track conditions change, the weather changes. All of those things create a... Um, 
you know, a variable matrix of things that you have to adapt to. So I may have a preferred line. It may not work every time for every track condition. I may have to adjust that based on what I feel in the car or what I go out and I look at the data and say, yeah, I'm just not able to make the car stick like it did a month ago because the track conditions were different. Yeah, exactly. So you have to kind of learn what the parameters of your car and what it's capable of in order to then can make those comparisons in the data and, and to try the, some consistency in order to be able to try those different lines and look at the data and subjectively say, yes, this is faster than that based on the current conditions because I, I'm able to run it consistently enough. I see a, I see a note that's actually in the chat, but I, I, but I, want, I would like to answer it as we, as we get ready to kind of wind this up. Uh, talked about uh, using um, uh, micron, micron fours and fives in, in quarter midgets and such a tight radius. And, uh, the, uh, and Nick, you, you're, you mentioned that um, is the accuracy there. I, boy, take, take a little bit of time, look at some of your data that, uh, that you have from the past, I think you're gonna find that there is large value there of understanding exactly how the driver is attacking that. Even, uh, even though it's a fairly tight corner, the, uh, the micron data is gonna give you down on really tight radiuses, 20, 25 foot radiuses. You're gonna find that that data does work pretty well in either karting or in, uh, in the quarter midget world that you're, that you're talking about. Give, give it a shot. I think you, you know, apply some of these techniques we've talked about. I think you're gonna find that there's some value there, so. I'm going to throw up a poll, while, and then I'm going to switch switch the data and, and jump back to the presentation. The um, future webinar topics. The um, this is one that uh, has has been very valuable to us. We're we're, we're constantly adjusting. So if you, uh, uh, you you have multiple choices here, so if you would uh, you would just take a look at that, answer some of those. I'm going to jump and back to the share of the presentation materials. jump into here. Uh, kind of a final thing as we're going, Jeremy, as you're kind of looking at the, any of those questions, if there's any that we might want to answer, or if is there any sure. of our, our AIM staff that have been looking at these, if there, is there anything in there that you guys might want to go, let me let me know. If not, uh, we will certainly answer those in writing. And Several questions about document. actual vehicle position and those kinds of things. Um, my understanding is there's going to be an entire separate webinar coming up talking about um, data alignment and making sure when you get down to some very specific comparisons that your data is aligned so that you're not making the wrong assumption based on looking at it uh, just as it's brought up. And then um, the, the, um, that, that um, seminar should get into like the snap function and those kinds of things. Yes, okay. I'm gonna end that polling and then share that with everybody so they can kind of take a, take a look at it. And uh, and uh, we'll see where we go with there. You can see that data analysis is uh, and, and and using not only data analysis and understanding the tools and, and the emails that I've been getting a lot after these uh, after these webinars as well. They they enjoy seeing the functionality and, and understanding exactly how to to do a channels report or or, or something. But they are more so in, uh, interested in not only the data analysis but also like what Jeremy's done and what uh, what James did last week in the. Um, in how to apply that and how to apply that to make uh, make your driving better make your car better you know actual uh, hands-on kind of stuff uh, track maps still right up in there I've, I've been adjusting and uh, we'll, we'll actually chat about some track map stuff I think earlier you know sooner than later as because we see that and the and the whole distinction of different ways that we use different track maps in in the race studio software so we will be uh, we'll be we'll be chatting about that as well so thanks for uh, thanks for uh, voting on those and, and, and taking those polls that that is very very helpful as we uh, as we're moving forward okay the um, um any other questions and answers i don't see that we're going to have take the time Maybe to do that right now we've got one more one final one final okay. thought in that okay. um you know this this topic we're talking about today of corner radius um this is not you know uh the holy grail tool right this is just another tool in your tool bag that you combine with the other tools to understand what's going on track there may be times when you use it there may be times when you don't use it you may be using it when you're learning a new track and then you don't look at it again. But you combine all of these tools together and you start to have a very powerful tool bag to analyze any situation that comes up. Okay, perfect, perfect. The, um, the next panel, we're just to talk a little bit about training and support. We, we, we generally give you an idea of where to go find some more things. Obviously these webinars are just fantastic and everybody's really enjoying the, them quite a bit. Uh, but uh, 
the, this webinar within an hour or so, you know, depending on uh, how things work out, but we try to beat them within an hour, is getting these things out there for you uh, up to the, to the Learn Fast e-training video site on YouTube. There's your address for it. There's, uh, there's over 60 uh, YouTube videos, not only the webinars, but also those direct functional things. How do you use GPS lap insert? How do you use, you know, configure your Wi-Fi? D different things that are just step-by-step -step processes, plus, the, of course, these webinars. So keep that in mind. Go visit the, the YouTube site if you, if you have a chance. That'll be linked in, uh, in, in all of the YouTube uh, uh, videos. You can, you know, jump, uh, jump out and, and go to different areas. Certainly in the emails you've been getting, you've been getting the link directly to that as well. We're, we're really a big customer support company. We want to help everybody get uh, the, just the most you can out of these devices. So um, we're, we're looking forward to the time when we can get back out there to the track. But uh, until we do that, you, know, we ha you have these webinars and all of our YouTube videos, of course, and, and uh, the 800 number. Give us a call at the tech line if you have any questions about trying to do some of these things. And, and uh, we're, we're here to help as best we can. Next webinar. Next webinar, we're going to have a, a, a brand new co-host as well. The, the first time that he's uh, helped us, he'll be doing many more as, as well, Jeremy, and, uh, and some of the other folks as well. We have three or four or five more guys lined up that you're going to start to see. Uh, Matt Romanowski from trailbreak.com is going to be here. We're going to talk, uh, go into depth of using your data, and we're going to start with friction circles, but it's really about uh, X, Y plots. We're going to look at two or three different ways of, of not just looking at the squiggly lines, but putting those together in, uh, in, in the X, Y plot function. You know, the focus of a lot of people that do that is friction circles, but, but uh, Matt's going to show us some different ways of getting value out of the software using that. So looking forward to that uh, uh, next Tuesday, April 28th. We'll uh, go live at 10 o'clock uh, uh, Pacific, 1 o'clock Eastern as well. So the, um, That will tie in nicely with some of those questions about understanding if you're getting the max performance out of the vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. Again, yeah, we're trying I, I to break these down that. into manageable chunks for everybody so that you can get one concept and then build on it with the next one. Exactly. So the uh, kind of here f finalizing this all up, we got some contact information here. Jeremy's uh, nice enough to provide his email address. He went over some topics. We, we, you know, we, we only spent 30, 35 minutes and uh, Jeremy did a great job, but yeah, especially when he wear, wears his engineering hat like that sometimes, right? It's, uh, it's hard to explain some things uh, this in depth that quickly. So you may have more questions. Jeremy is, is open uh, if you want the math channels or, or contact me as well. And, uh, and send me an email. Uh, we'll get you the, some math channel functions. We'll get you these actual corner radius things. If anybody wants a copy of the, the presentation, we'll, we'll, we'll create that into a PDF and, and, and we'll put it up on the YouTube uh, description information box there as well. So anything else you would like to add, uh, Jeremy, before we close her down? No, I just thank you for letting me be a part of this today. And uh, hopefully this helps everyone. And that's one of the great things about the AIM community is how much help there is for everyone to get faster. Yeah, the biggest thanks goes to you for putting it together. Just a ton of work to put all this together. I know it's, uh, you know, we're all busy too. And, uh, and, and thank you and, and all the rest of the co-hosts uh, that have been putting all these things together. It's, uh, it's very valuable for everybody. So thank you very much. Perfect. With that, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call it a day on this one. I appreciate it. Thanks to everybody that came. Uh, stay healthy and, uh, and we'll see you at the next one and uh, on, on uh, next Tuesday. Talk to you soon. Take care.